Hey everyone, welcome back to the Sports Psych Show. Thanks so much for joining me. Today, I'm really excited to be joined by Dr. Alexander Latinjak. Alexander, welcome to the Sports Psych Show. Hello, thank you for having me. Really uh, honoured and uh, delighted to be speaking with you today. We're going to be talking self-talk. Um, you've got a book out on self-talk and we're going to be making making sense of self-talk with relation to other psychological processes and, and mental skills and so on and so forth. Um, but Alexander, we always start by having guests introduce themselves to the Sports Psych Show audience. So um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, so right now I'm Associate Professor at the University of Suffolk in the UK, close to London. Um, in relation with sports psychology, I guess the history that makes sense is I was a former tennis player. Um, the second most lucky type of tennis players, those that are very good when they're or quite good when they're young, good enough to leave home, conquer somehow the world, and then lucky enough with 16, 17 to notice that they're not good enough to make it on the pro circuit so they can go and study. Of course, the most lucky ones are the ones who make it to the top level, become millionaires, and yes. then, you know, just live the life. Um, I was always really happy not to be one of those who could have made it but didn't make it and needed to wait until they're 28, 29 to find out. So, yeah, that's my sports background. From there, I went to study psychology. And one of the things I always say, it's not ethically really great, but uh, I started doing sports psychology in my first year at the university. So I did speak some languages, and in my former tennis academy where I played, they needed a sports psychologist. Well, no, they had a sports psychologist, but they needed somebody who could translate for that sports psychologist from Spanish and Catalan to English and German. So they gave me a job. Let's call it a job. Well, if you require a salary, it wasn't a job. But they gave me a chance to be there and learn from that sports psychologist and even take over some clients or do some sessions myself and introduce my ideas. And actually, the first thing I did when I ever had the chance was self-talk. I didn't know what it was called. I didn't know what it was for, but I just had to do something, and I went to the self-talk intervention. So from there, I studied psychology. I did a PhD in psychology, all about self-talk and sports psychology, of course. And the rest is I taught for seven years in Spain, uh, having clients on the side always, always worked in applied, sometimes, you know, for clubs, sometimes for individual athletes. And then since 2017, I've been in, in Ipswich. Well, well, that was the corona thing, which made me basically work from home for two years. But let's say for five years, I've been now in the UK. I'm still enjoying it. So that's a little bit about me. Not not quite the same Spanish weather, though. Uh, no, I'm suffering right now here in Spain, 38 degrees. I really oh, miss wow. the UK. Well, I, 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 I kind of see it the other way around. I'd love to be in 38 degrees, basking in 38 degrees right now. I, that is hot. That's extreme. It's really interesting. Your background has um, really resonated with me, Alexander, because some parallels there. I mean, I, I was uh, I was a golfer and not dissimilar to your description. I was good enough to have a go as a youngster and, and golf is obviously a different sport to tennis in as much as, hey, you can be a pro for 40, 50 years, right? But um, I, I, I realized pretty quickly all oh, no, I really need to go and do something else here. Otherwise, I'm 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 going to be eating out of a baked bean baked bean tin can for the rest of my life. So um, yeah, that that made me chuckle. You sort of saying, well, I was I was good enough to give this a go, but not for very long, you know. Uh, and and it's interesting saying you don't envy the ones who sort of spent their whole twenties giving it a go, um, you know, because as you say, that can be quite a challenging position to be in. Um, and the other thing that interests me about your background there is that as a, a, a golfer, I was coaching our county side and I was doing quite a lot of sports psychology on the side. Having that opportunity to consult quite early, I think really helped me. 
I mean, I suppose an initial question to you there is, do you think that that really early opportunity, do you think that that gave you a bit of a head start in many respects? Definitely. I'd say it's similar to what sports careers look like. You know, the theories about implicit, explicit learning, Mm. that when you learn implicitly, that whatever you learn is not linked to basic memory. It's within the executive circuit. And from there on, it's much more resilient to stress. And when you start early, you don't question as many things. You basically make up things and just learn on the go implicitly. So I developed self-talk interventions before I knew about self-talk, before I had my first ever lesson in sports psychology. Now, ethically, of course, today, things are much more constrained, much more organized. You have, in the UK, you have BPS, you have a basis which regulate uh, sports psychologists working. You couldn't do that. But again, that was the early 2000s. And at least in Spain, there was no regulation at all. Uh, I learned from a psychoanalyst who basically lay down kids were 14, 15 on a couch and sat behind them and did psychoanalysis with them, which wow. today would be really weird. Back <laughs> then, that was what you did. There weren't yeah. that many sports psychologists. Yeah. Um, but I do recognize I, I did profit a lot from these early learning opportunities, uh, while other people will have a really hard time to do that today. However, they have much better educational opportunities than we had back then, I guess. Just... um. Dwelling on tennis for a few seconds, because I think the psychology of tennis is is fascinating. And, you know, we'll we'll unpack the self-talk stuff in in a bit, but you may even refer to self-talk here. I've done a little bit in tennis. Um, I've traveled a little bit on some of the mini tours. And they can be some quite challenging places to be. There's, there can be quite a lot of overt demonstration of anger and frustration out in those court, courts. I, I found that there were sort of screams and shouts echoing across all the courts on those mini tours. It's, you know, as sports psychologists, we talk about the potential importance of emotional management. But tennis does seem like a sport where some players, it seems... Um, allow their emotions to bubble away and be at the forefront of their game. Was that the same for you as a tennis player and and, and as a former tennis player? When you watch, I mean, right now as we're recording, we've got Wimbledon going on and we've got one uh, uh, Mr. Nick Kyrgios, who right now as we're we're recording is playing uh, a a game and he's obviously a, a controversial figure, but it's quite an emotional game. And, and you don't necessarily see a lot of emotional management all the time. Um, no question there, Alexander, but just w- wouldn't mind getting your thoughts on that. Well, I was the type of tennis player who needed about three to four records a year because they had a tendency of flying by themselves against walls. And <laughs> I was absolutely maniac. Um, this really? Is fun, this is a funny thing. I'm a very calm person. Uh, a lot of people now I don't know anyone anymore who saw me play tennis besides my parents and um, people wouldn't imagine me going absolutely crazy but I was part of tennis now I've worked with many tennis players from from the big well important ones to junior level and what I found out that there are two ways of handling emotions there are very few who dominate their emotions, who can control them, suppress them. And most players who are successful learn to play with their emotions. That's why you can see some players taking advantage of them. But that's not new. Um, I would say it was McEnroe who basically used this emotional outburst as a sort of coping strategy or, or almost tactical strategy. That's why it's so interesting in tennis, at least, uh, acceptance techniques have a really, really lot of potential. Also because it's a very recurring sport, so you can't fight off anger in a five-set men's tennis match. It's just going to come back and come back and come back. And most players, at one point, they explode. Just not sure if you want to call it ego depletion, you know that word from science, the, the mental fatigue, the self-regulatory fatigue. It's very... It's criticized, the whole literature. But there is something to it. There comes a moment where you just can't hold it anymore. 
So being able to use it instead of holding it back is something that makes a huge difference for tennis players. So essentially to use it to energize yourself uh, towards your skills? Yes. So you have to understand, well, I try to understand every emotion as giving, as changing the person slightly. So we are not wax figures from Madame Tussauds museum, even though we look the same from the outside, from the inside, we're, we're changing. A tennis player who is, for example, angry, has courage and has determination and has energy. Now, there are tactical ways of playing tennis that can use those. Now, if you try and play defensively while being angry, you're not doing it the right way. What you should be doing is using that anger. That anger will give you determination. If you're anxious, you're able to run. You will be able to run forever being anxious. But you're going to be tense, so you're going to lack precision. So trying to counterattack or hitting the balls with precision is just using your emotion the wrong way. But even if you're demotivated, a lot of tennis players intuitively know that. Demotivation gives you uh, muscle relaxation. And muscle relaxation gives you momentum in tennis, acceleration, and precision. Mm -hmm. That's why a desperate tennis player, you know, the ones who have nothing to lose, are very, very dangerous. They're going to hit big shots, and they make them more often than not. Now, if you know that, then you use it. Now, of course, once you get close, for example, you were down 5-love, you get to 5-4, and you start getting nervous, but you still try and hit the big shots, then you lose. So good tennis players know how to use their state and what to do with it. That makes a huge difference. Now, they also fight sometimes against emotions. That's, that, that's also true. But fighting all the time your emotions is very, very hard. Exhausting. Exhausting, yes, indeed. Something you said there I think was really interesting to me, matching mindset with strategy or matching, when I say mindset, my, uh, matching emotion with strategy is probably a more accurate term. That intelligent tennis is understanding where you are, how you're feeling, and understanding whether that might help a particular strategy that you're engaging with or may hinder that. I think that's, that's really interesting. It's not only tennis. So I've worked in different sports. The last one I worked was basketball okay. on elite levels. Yep. And we played a final four tournament to get to Spanish, Spanish first division. And I had a chat with the coach. And, well, we tried to match different strategies to different emotional moments. So, for example, if we are nervous, probably, and, are, um, and the opponents are nervous, probably they won't be fast enough to block our three-point throws. But we won't have the precision to do that. So when we're nervous, we need to get under the basket and really use the strength that nervousness gives us to get an advantage close to the basket because we don't have the precision. Now, once we're relaxed, once we're... I don't like the word confident, but, I mean, people use it. Once we're confident, then we can take the long shots, probably because we're just way too relaxed to fight ourselves under the basket because the strength is something in basketball. But we can use the distance. Now, these are very simple... Changes. The same thing in football. Mm. We had a football coach who said, both teams are nervous. Don't try and play pretty football. Just get the ball with the most accidental way into the box, and you might find yourself a goal. Because neither your players, your players don't have the precision for the nice pass, and the other players are way too anxious to miss anything. So if you know how to use emotional states, but also tensional states, you can adjust tactics to that. That's really interesting, just dwelling on the basketball example for a second, because that's quite granular detail that would require players to be quite self-aware. Was that just what you're detailing there for us? Was that just you and the coach discussing how if the coach observes a certain emotional state, uh, then that can lead to certain strategies or plays that he might suggest to the team? Or did you get the team, the players involved in that conversation? In this case, I didn't. In this case, I was yeah. the consultant to the coach. 
and I had very I had some input with the players. Of course, you know the players because you you're with the team. But I hadn't had the chance to work with them. I did in the past with other teams. Um, and we worked on those small details. Now, in this case, it was the coach with my help as well. So we had different body positions that would signalize your team is nervous. Um, your team is, you should go. And I tried to somehow simulate um, the emotion that I think the team was having. There's still the coach's call, of course. And he didn't listen to me all the time, which is a nice thing, I guess. As a sports psychologist, we are, we are a resource. Yeah. Yeah. We're like salad in the fridge. It's good to have it. You might not eat it. So, but I think it did make a small difference. At some point, he remembered. Oh yeah, that's interesting. So, when you reflect back, or you know, in general, with that kind of granular detail around emotion, so the relationship of emotion to strategy in basketball. I can see in tennis because you've got this individual tennis player and you can instigate that conversation and you could possibly withdraw quite quickly from that conversation if you feel that this tennis player isn't necessarily getting uh, getting what you're talking about. But with basketball, you're there in a room with a number of players. Do, would you ha- Would you have that conversation with players discussing strategies, relationship with emotion or do you think that's really kept best at coach level? I have worked with players on dealing with the tactical matter and emotions. So okay. what we've done in the past, not with this team, with other teams, is uh, one of my, my contributions has always been to do integrated psychological skills training. That is, I go to a training session, I stand next to the coach, I take the coach's exercises, uh, tweak little bits and pieces to create or simulate situations or needs that will happen in basketball games or any any games. I did with tennis, basketball, football, rowing, whatever you want. But in basketball, so you got your players there throwing three uh, three pointers, and you see that they're actually they're in a good run. They're getting the confidence, and coaches would never disrupt that because for them confidence is everything. But then I tell them, if your training environment is always promoting confidence, your players tactically only know how to play when they're confident. They haven't learned how to play when they're under stress. So suddenly we go, we take the clock, we put the clock backwards. That's something that frightens everyone. Uh, We count down and they had to make a certain number of three pointers. in that time, there was no, there's nothing else. They're competitive. Some people ask me, do you, well, do you put some reinforcements, negative reinforcements, or, or do you make them run or, or something if they fail? No, no. Just giving them a task and saying, I don't believe that you can make it. For a bunch of professional uh, sports people, that's enough to get every motion going. And suddenly, the three pointers um, start. They started missing them. So what we did then. Well, we got together. We asked them, so how did it go? Now nah, that that was crap, and that wasn't good. Uh, I asked them why, and they're like, "Well, you stressed us, and we lost confidence." And I was like, "Good." Now, what do you think your opponents will do? Will, do you think your opponents will be there giving you confidence? That probably they say no. There's always a strange one, but probably they say no. And then they're saying, "Okay, now I can go and not come back ever." Or I can start preparing you so that you can actually deal with those situations. That's how we start working. And then we create situations where we don't put any stresses and we ask them to decide if they go into the box or or throw from far out. And then we create situations, you know, where they're under stress and they can take the decision. So this is the first step. And the second step would be we force them to throw from distance, but when they're under stress, They have to start working on their psychological skills. They have to self-regulate. So first, the tactical decision with who you are, and then we try and improve who you are so that you have a greater variety of decision-making. I love so so much of that. And, you know, back in episode 135, we spoke with Dr. Oliver Runswick, who's uh, predominantly an academic in the area of skill acquisition. We talked about contextual priors 
representative learning designs. Um, and I, I just love that idea. I'm constantly writing about the importance, I think, of um, psychologists, sports psychologists being more involved on the grass, the court, the course, because I think that that's where it, it, it's at. And, and being involved in that session design, I think, is so important. So I, I absolutely loved what you were speaking about there. You used that word confidence a bit. My last question before we get on to the self-talk piece, but I suppose it's all all related, especially when we talk about that those integrated psychological skills sessions. You said you didn't love the word confidence. Would you unpack that a little bit for us? Because confidence is a word that if, I, th- I think if you asked 100 people in a room to think of some psychological terms related to sport, I would just wonder if confidence might be the one that they come up with most. What do you, Alexander, not love about this notion of confidence? Well, the first thing is that although confidence is a socially set, shared meaning that we need to communicate, but it's hard to work on. There is no way of actually improving confidence. Confidence isn't a skill. Confidence is a descriptor. It describes people. It is true some people have traits that predispose them being more confident than not. So, for example, high self-esteem. But the confidence you have in a certain moment is an illusion. It's like you know, the hot hand illusion. Confidence... You open up a human being and there is nothing like confidence. Confidence is one's beliefs about one's abilities. But the fact that I have more confidence doesn't mean anything. So, okay, let's unpack that a little bit more. So, for me, performance is explained by a certain number of variables. And I want to get in everything because it's way too much. But there is some things that influence. And some are, for example, your skills. A skill is a trait, is something that describes you theoretically, but then it depends on exactly your your behavioral intentions when you perform. So I might have a great forehand, but today while I'm hitting my forehand in tennis, I'm just not feeling it. You know, my intentions, I'm not really sure about my intentions. Should I hit the ball a bit early, a bit later, a bit more to the left, a bit more to the right? Okay, of course, the better my skills, the more likely that my behavioral intentions are better. But, you know, even the best players have moments where they couldn't really, their skills weren't relevant because they didn't know how to translate them into, into actions. Now, the more I'm adapted to the situation physiologically, psychologically, socially, and behaviorally, the more I could say that's confidence. But the confidence itself doesn't exist. What does exist? Being physiologically in the right state, being psychologically in the right state, being socially in the right place and having the correct decisions and behavioral intentions now those four things i can work with and if i do my job right my athlete will experience confidence for them the big important thing was confidence but confidence is just a summary word there is nothing i can do to actually promote confidence i can work on on my psychological states for example by giving self-efficacy motivation clarity of goals i can work on my physiological state Either, ar- either heightening or lowering physiological arousal. I can work on social experiences, giving my athlete the sensation they are accompanied, they are not judged, they are supported, and I can work with them on their behavioral intentions or decisions. For example, by indicating if they should be attacking more, being more patient, standing further behind the baseline, uh, inside the court, taking a, a, a three-pointer, or passing at one touch in football. And all that, if I do my job right, they will experience confidence. But I can't shout at them saying, come on, use your confidence. It's not a thing. So that that's when I say I don't like the word confidence. So all of those mini factors, if you want to call them those, a psychological state, a physiological state, a social situation or, 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 or position, if you, I mean, if we took Albert Bandura's self-efficacy theory, which could be described as situated self-confidence, and we examine his four stroke five sources, past experience, vicarious experience, verbal persuasion, emotional, physiological state, latterly imaginal experience, 
are they sort of, would you say they're packed into, they're kind of cause and effect, they're packed into that psychological state and physiological state and social experience. Is that, is that where you would stand with Albert Bandura's work? Um, okay. Albert Bandura is infinitely more important than I am. So it's really <laughs> hard to say. His theory is hugely oversimplified. So, yes, it is true. There are several things that contribute to self-efficacy or confidence. So, for example, we have uh, the experience of others or external influences. He yet, external influences, whatever happens in the outside doesn't impact us directly. It passes through the filter of well, physiological input, external attention, yes. and psychological appraisal, which makes it infinitely more complicated. Verbal persuasion is the same thing, but verbal persuasion... Albert Bandura could have been a bit more specific if that refers to external verbal persuasion, or we talk about self-talk, which is internal verbal persuasion, uh, to which would lead us to a very complicated thing is that the self can be split in different parts, and that is part of self-talk. There's a part of the self that can talk to the other part of the self doing verbal persuasion, which is hugely complicated, but it doesn't even make sense on a neurological level. So... Um, so past experiences, again, yep. past experiences are memory. The past experiences could also become part of who we are. You know, the past experiences have changed psychological traits like personality, like identity, life goals, or sport goals. So traits, they can be changed by past experience. Now, there's a difference between me remembering what happened in the past or what has happened in the past having had an impact on my personality. And my new personality now leads me to be more self-confident. Two completely different things. So it's not wrong. He doesn't say anything wrong. And I think he makes the bullet points very clear. And on a basic applied level, you can use Bandura's theory, and it, it's absolutely phenomenal. But if you really try and understand where performance comes from, where behavior comes from, I think you need to take a bit more detailed approach to that. Let's. I, I could talk to you all day about that. Anyway, I want to unpack self-talk because you've mentioned it a few times there and that's what we're here to do so um can you define self-talk because it, it, this is this term that floats about i talk about it a lot lots of sports sites talk about it a lot can you can you define self-talk for me to start with and then perhaps start to tell us a little bit about different types of self-talk because i think you do this outstandingly well it's one of my favorite sports psychology chapters in your book on self-talk um so can you yeah define and unpack it a bit for us so yes the definition of self-talk is quite easy it's verbalizations addressed to the self now what that means is self-talk have their messages they come in some sort of verbal or Yes, verbal form. They need to have some grammar. They need to have some syntaxes, even if it's the easiest or simplest kind. So that distinguishes it from other non-verbal cognitive activities like ima imagery, non-verbal thinking, um, whatever yeah. you want. So there, there, there are other things, but this is verbal. And then it's not directed at anyone else, but it is directed at the self. So that is a very, very simple definition. The problem that we find in the literature is that this uh, definition has then been applied to different experiences, different things that happens in real life. But we find that everywhere. We find that with different words, with emotion, with motivation. We define concepts because that helps us make sense of this hyper-complex reality. There's nothing like a self-talk or emotion or motivation running around the world. You can go in Hyde Park and you won't find self-confidence jumping around the grass field. That doesn't happen. We need to understand people. So we take something, give it a name, and then study it. And self-talk is that. So, yeah, there's people talking, but not to anyone else. So let's call it self-talk. Ingenious, great word. I love it. And every time that happens, we believe it's the same thing. So once we put these concepts to, to real world, well, that's really helpful. The problem is sometimes we let those concepts tyrannize the way we understand the world. So because this it's self-talk, so it has to be the same thing than that other self-talk. And that's not true. There are very different things in that idea of self-talk. So the first distinction 
I think it's worth mentioning is most self-talk, 99.9% .9 of self-talk comes from people. People just do self-talk. We are hardwired in a way that we self-talk. Everybody, voluntarily and voluntarily, we self-talk. We talk to ourselves. Okay? But in science, in 1987, Susan Siegler publishes an article, a very important article that's called uh, something like self -cue, the effect of self-cueing on tennis ground stroke performance in, beginning, in beginner tennis players, more or less. A genius paper. It's the first time in sports psychology somebody used people saying something to themselves as a means to improve learning. So that was a very simple one. I don't remember all the cue words, but it was basically when the coach hit the ball, they said hit. When the ball uh, bounced on their court, they said bounce. When they hit the ball, they said impact. And when the ball hit the, 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 the ground on the other side of the court, they said ready. So that helped them to know where to look at. So hit, I look at the coach. Bounce, I look at the bounce of the ball. Impact, I look at my racket impacting on the ball. And ready means I have to get in the ready position for the next shot. And Susan Siegler proved that, proved to a certain degree, that that worked, at least it could work. Now, she didn't call it self-talk, she called it self-cueing. And not always science is progressing in the right direction, because I would still say that self-cueing was a much better word than what happened later. But what happened later is that many people picked up on that idea. And, for example, there's Yanis Theodorakis from Greece, who wrote an absolutely phenomenal paper in the year 2000. Possibly he wrote it before it was published in the year 2000, where he compared motivational and instructional self-talk on different tasks. Okay, from there on, everything exploded. But that paper is absolutely phenomenal. The thing is, he called it self-talk instead of self-cueing. And suddenly, it was the same thing than, than Aladdin Bango was studying, uh, James Hardy, who was basically asking people in gyms, what do they tell themselves? They were both called self-talk. And that led, for example, to a strange situation where James Hardy, who has done his whole PhD on studying people's self-talk, to create a definition of, about self-talk, including the literature on motivational instructional cue words. And he ended up saying that self-talk has to serve at least two functions, motivational and instructional. That's, that's completely wrong. And I know, James, um, it's not completely wrong. It's just oversimplified. I know, James, uh, I, think, I hope I have a good relationship with him. We have published the latest to so the book. He's in the book and probably the chapter you're referring to. He was a co-author. And all the theoretical papers we have done, James is part of it. And probably just to say that 2006 paper, speaking clearly, is one of the best theoretical papers ever written. It's absolutely amazing. He just takes and recollects all definitions of self-talk and one by one he knocks them down. Politely, academically, but he basically told, I don't know how many professors to, you know, just try again. You're wrong. Absolutely phenomenal. Um, but that is how things get confused. So I would like to make that clear. There is people doing self-talk just because they were born to do so. And if you want to know how it how that happens, we could talk about Vygotsky, but probably we're getting off topic there. But that is people's self-talk. And then there is people repeating cue words. That is something different. Because the first is a cognitive process. Self-talk is a way of thinking. The second one is a behavioral process. You do repeat those words. You might not even think about them. And I have evidence of people thinking while they're saying those words to themselves. I have people doing natural self-talk about the cue words they have to repeat. So that's the first distinction. Natural self-talk. Now, I wanted to call it natural self-talk and reviewers Reviews are the enemy of free thought today. Uh, I'm a reviewer, so I, I can say that without insulting <laughs> anyone else, just myself. But they somehow um, advised me politely to either call it organic self-talk or, or not publish. So today we call it organic self-talk, which is not the worst. Organic self-talk is the self-talk that comes from people, and it represents thought processes. 
Because I'm just going to add one more theoretical distinction here, because uh, if your listeners are applied practitioners, their head's going to go and explode. My PhD students don't follow what I'm explaining most of the time. But this is important. <laughs> this is really, really important. No, please. Um, the human brain, a very, very broad distinction, can work in two ways. And Daniel Kahneman won a Nobel Prize this, uh, basically talking about that. Yes. There is an intuitive way of thinking, making decisions and self-talking. Yep. And then there is a more rational, intentional way of thinking, decision-making and self-talk. So in self-talk, we can distinguish an intuitive self-talk, something that just bursts out of the person. They didn't really want to say it, but they did. So there's the self-insults, but also, you know, the, some celebrations, some spontaneous analysis of situations. That's there. And then we have an intentional self-talk. So there is there authors who even talk about the mind is split in two. And the second part of the mind is talking to the first one. That's rational self-talk. Now, in my in my way, in my uh, studies, one we call it spontaneous self-talk because it happens spontaneously. And the second we call it goal-directed self-talk because it is always aimed at some sort of self-regulation. But yeah, so all together, I would say we have organic self-talk, which can be more spontaneous or more goal-directed. And then we have the repetition of keywords. And the repetition of keywords can be goal-directed, just like just the organic one, but it, it's not a representation of what people think. It is an action people do. They repeat a word like a behavior. I hope that cleared some things up or at least showed how complicated things are. I love it, both. It, sh it, it showed its, I suppose, complexity in, in terms of its levels, but certainly cleared, uh, for me, clears things up in terms of what I'm hearing you say is um, organic self-talk and keywords. Organic self-talk and, and please come back at me if I if I get this wrong because I I want this to be to be clear for everybody listening in. Organic self talk, cue words. Organic self talk is either spontaneous or goal directed, and then you've got cue words which can be goal directed, and they are 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 essentially related to behaviours as well. Am I on the right track there? Almost, almost. So I would say that. Keywords, they're always goal directed. That's why we create those cues. They're always goal directed. But they're not the same as goal directed self talk. Whereas goal directed self talk is the mind intentionally trying to self regulate, the keywords have been prepared in advance, either by the sports psychologist, maybe by a coach, yes. maybe by a book, or maybe even by the person who sat down in the evening before a competition and wrote down some keywords on a piece of paper that they would repeat. Yes. And when I say that keywords are behaviors, because the behavior is repeating keywords. Talking can be a behavior. And in that sense, uh, I see it as a behavior. Whereas goal-directed self-talk, spontaneous self-talk, they're thinking. That's, it. That, that's interesting with the keywords always associating it with that. A, a behavior because you say talking is a behavior which absolutely makes sense and it almost embodies the notion of self-talk would that make mm. sense to you it kind of it, it it i always say to 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 audiences or to to clients one of the biggest or at least in my opinion one of the biggest myths in psychology or sports psychology is that sports psychology is everything from the neck upwards that what we do is essentially embodied um, a lot of the time, most of the time, perhaps. And it, it feels like that notion of cue words when you're, when you're saying that talking is a, is a behavior. And so cue, cue words are always goal directed and they're uh, associated with a behavior because you are behaving by using cue words, you are behaving. It's a, it, it, it's embodied and potentially embedded 
into your performance environment. Yes, definitely. Can we talk a bit more about so organic self talk, spontaneous and goal directed? So, so the the spontaneous is very much this intuitive self talk. We're always, as you say, ninety nine point nine percent of the time, we're we're essentially engaging in some kind of mental processing. So that's the spontaneous self talk. And the goal directed is we can talk back to ourselves. Is that what you're saying? Uh, in a sense, yes. So the question is, why do we self talk? And there is where we find huge differences between spontaneous and goal directed self talk. A spontaneous self-talk is a reflection of who we are. Let's say you're angry. When you're angry, you might tell yourself something like, everything is a mess. Or I don't want to stay here, I want to go home. I will never play football again. There's no re- reason. You don't, you don't say it to, to coordinate your behavior or to change something. But still, if the human brain is predisposed to create those statements that must serve a function. And the function is very important. You express how you are through spontaneous self-talk. So spontaneous self-talk helps different states come into awareness. It might not have been that clear that you're angry until you said that you're angry or you said that you want to leave this place or you want to go home or you will never want to come back spontaneous self-talk is the default mechanism of the human brain that helps the human brain get aware of a person's challenges internal challenges and without awareness there can't be any self-regulation there, there is automatic bodily regulation like temperature regulation that, that yes But conscious human self-regulation is based on the fact that we know that we have challenges. We are aware of our challenges and we want to change them. We all have the experience of being angry and not being really aware of it. And then behaving in a way that we didn't want to behave. If we had just known at the time that what we were doing, we're doing it out of anger. Now, spontaneous self-talk helps. doesn't always help, but it is meant to help people become aware of their psychological challenges or internal challenges. Now, then we self-regulate. For example, you try and, you know, there's problem-oriented self-regulation. You try to convert your anger into understanding. Or there's appraisal-oriented self-regulation. You try and change a negative impression of somebody else's behavior into a positive impression. There there are different ways of self-regulation. Goal-directed self-talk helps self-regulation. So if I'm trying to change my emotion from anger into understanding, I can try. But if I use words next to my intentions, my intentions just become much more efficient. Goal-directed self-talk is a support mechanism for every self-regulation strategy. I can use goal-directed self-talk trying to be more persuasive. I can tr- use goal-directed self-talk trying to be a better leader. I can use goal-directed self-talk to handle better my emotions. I can use goal-directed self-talk to change my thoughts. I can use goal-directed self-talk to enhance self-efficacy. There are different psychological control mechanisms, and goal-directed self-talk basically is a booster for each and every one of them. Sometimes it works better, sometimes it works worse. There are conditions to self-talk, goal-directed self-talk work. But can you see the difference in functionality? Spontaneous self-talk helps us become aware of our challenges. Goal-directed self-talk helps us handle our challenges. And that is a huge difference. So if we're engaging in intentional, goal-directed self-talk, can you give us some examples of what that might look like or be. If that's not the same as Q words, what could, in that moment, I'm experiencing my intuitive, spontaneous self-talk helps me become aware of anger. I'm getting angry. So can you give an example? Or I'm getting anxious. Can you give me some examples of what 
goal directed self talk could look like, sound like, what the content might be? Okay, uh, I can and I will, but I want to uh, just point something out. A lot of times in the literature, myself and others, we have used examples for goal directed self talk. And because you have a limitation in page numbers, you make it short and you use keywords yes. as examples for goal directed self talk. Goal directed self talk might look much more like imagine I'm here talking to you. Imagine I'm becoming aware that I'm nervous because I'm participating in a huge podcast and I really want people to like what I do. So I'm starting to get nervous and I'm starting to get confused. And now I'm like, okay, you're, you're getting confused. You're getting nervous. You need to slow down. There's no time limit. Now you can really take it slowly, just step by step. And then there's my spontaneous self coming back and giving me feedback on that, on that strategy. Yes, but if you talk slowly, you look like an idiot. And I'm like, no, I'm an idiot if I say stupid things. So even though I say slowly interesting things, the, the only thing that I am is slow. But it's better to be slow than stupid. So let's focus on saying the right things. Now, how can we say the right things? Okay, look, think about the five important things you want to say. And let's go point by point around them. But also, breathe. And every time you think you're talking too fast, take a bit of water and drink that. And then my spontaneous self talk says, yeah, but if you drink too much, well, you're going to have to go to the bathroom. And then my goal-directed self-talk says something else. And it's a conversation. It's not one sentence. It's not one statement. It's a part of yourself trying to control your feelings, your emotions, your social experiences, even your bodily sensations. It's like if I asked you, okay, I, I'm, I'm coming from Mars, so I'm, 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 you know, I'm an alien. And I've read there is coaches. Coaches exist. Can you give me an example of what a coach would say? You can't do it. You can't give me an example. But it's much more complex than that. A coach would interact with you in a narrative. It's not only about what you say, when you say it, how often you say it, how much you believe in what you say, which tone you have in your mind when you say it. There's so much more to it. It's so hyper-complex. Because it's a representation of your system to thinking, according to Dynamon, of your rational thought processes. I mean, rational thought processes are one of the things that have given humans their evolutionary edge over other animals. So it can't be that simple. So yes, in our articles, if you read it, and it says, an example for goal-directed self-talk is an athlete saying, yes, you can. And that's exactly a statement that you could convert into a keyword and use yeah, but that's just the oversimplification we use in articles. And I've become aware of it over the years because people get more and more confused. And part of them getting more confused is myself by using those oversimplified examples. If you really want to know what goal-directed self-talk is like, well, observe yourself. And you try and convince yourself. You try and solve a, pro a problem, a puzzle. That's a long conversation. That's a narrative. And then it gets intermixed with feelings and emotions and visualization because one psychological skill, like gold direct itself, hardly ever comes in isolation. So you might, you know, compensate something you don't know how to say with imagining it. It's just very, very, humans are very complicated. <laughs> don't we know it the image i was getting as you were speaking was that idea of a puppet on not just a string but a bunch of strings with the hand you know with a couple of bits of wood that attach to the strings and and, and the hand is like the self-talk is like the controller and as you said self-talk influences these other psychological processes and as you were speaking there you know you as you were giving examples you were talking about take a breath slow down pay attention to these things here so is is i think out of all of that which is incredible and fascinating i think it's so important isn't it for for people for competitors for coaches to understand the dynamic nature of self talk that it it's it's one of those mental skills that really draws on other psychological processes breathing attention uh, mental state you know whatever other psych processes you want to talk about but it's it's such a 
a big influencer, isn't it? So you can draw all of these psychological processes into your self-talk and influence and subsequently influence your behavior and influence your performance. Would I be yes, definitely. correctly there? I think the most important thing is to understand how important goal-directed self-talk is for self-regulation. Um, one way to understand it is to compare it with the power of language in human evolution. Think back at humans before we had a clear language and try to imagine how a tribe of primitive humans build a society, build tools, educate their children without language. That is like our self-regulation without the power of language. Goal-directed self-talk adds the power of language to self-regulation. And, and it must bear relation with personality. I mean, for me, from the personality science literature, personality exists to help us get along and get ahead. It, it, it's something that's evolved in us. You know, we are neurotic for a reason, to withdraw uh, for example, uh, away from danger, uh, we are conscientious for a reason, you know, to 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 be industrious, to be to be useful um, in our in our tribe. We are extroverted or introverted for a reason. Again, two things that help us get along, get ahead. And I, I'm saying this, Alexander, because I'm just thinking of how you know you drawing on evolutionary psychology there, how self talk must. You know, it goes hand in hand with personality, doesn't it? That that's that's I suppose the intuitive, spontaneous side of us. It's uh, it's almost like an uh, uh, an implicit um, example of, or an implicit representation of our personality. What we're saying to ourselves is an implicit representation of the personality we're experiencing at any given moment. Definitely, that's spontaneous self-talk. It's the mirror of who we are and how we are. And then goal-directed self-talk is our way of handling problems. But a very self-conscious person could use goal-directed self-talk to change the way they are. So let's say I'm a very neurotic person. Probably my spontaneous self-talk, I could even say, you're always neurotic, you're always emotional, you have such difficulties controlling yourself. And then as a neurotic person, I also try and hold my emotions back. So my original goal-directed self-talk would be, um, you don't feel, be calm, everything is all right. But at some point, my goal-directed self-talk can say, can't you see that you're so, just self-perpetuating? You're neurotic. That means that emotions are the center of the understanding of yourself. So now you're using, a goal, you're using yourself to try and suppress part of who you are. Let's be open to new experiences, for example. And just accept those emotions and live with those emotions. And maybe you change. So you can, the way you self regulate is an expression of who you are. But if you gain enough self awareness, you can turn, let's say it's like turning a gun on, on the person who was pointing it first. So it's your personality that basically sends you in one direction to self regulate. But at some point, you can just turn around and try to persuade the person who sent you in the first place. Now, that's all very complicated, so I'm not really sure if, if that is all clear. Uh, for me, it took me years to figure these things out. Uh, so I'm not sure if I can explain them in a couple of minutes. But No, no, I, 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 no you are with, with great clarity. And, and it makes me, as, as you're listening in, I mean, those who are listening, go on to the episode I speak with Professor Dan McAdams um, from North, Northwestern University. He created this wonderful personality uh, tripartite model of personality where he layered um, characteristic adaptations, motivated agency on traits, and then a narrative identity. And we talked about those characteristic ad adaptations that you're, for me, basically alluding to there, which is to be able to bend and flex our traits. We can use, you know, beliefs, values, uh, you know, any kind of any self-efficacy, any form of self-talk, um, to be able to to be able to shift, and really that's synonymous with we become a motivated agent from the age of five plus, don't we? That's where motivated agency sort of tends to tend to happen as we learn language and ourselves in the world and other people about other people acting in the world. So it all goes hand in hand for me. Yeah, definitely. One thing I wanted to ask you is because it was interesting because I was thinking, you know, you've worked in basketball, and it, 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 I don't know if you've experienced this, but I get 
or have historically had people say to me, well, golf, I get. I get that golf is psychological because, wow, there's so much time to think. And some people might say, well, I get tennis is psychological because, you know, when you change ends and you've got that time to, to, to think. But football, soccer, basketball, you know, how how can they be psychological? Because there's so little time to, to, to think. Now, I, I, I tend to answer that by saying, well, look, football, soccer works in seconds, but our brain and our nervous system works in milliseconds. So it's trumping the speed, speed of soccer, football, basketball every single time. But speaking to, to self-talk here, would you say it's, you know, very realistic that basketball players, as an example, will have at times an ongoing conversation with themselves as the game unfolds that, uh, you know, they, they have to engage in goal-directed. Yes, they want their key words, but they might engage in goal-directed self-talk to deal with the spontaneous self-talk that they're experiencing. Well, yes. So at first, I would say, as long as we have humans participating in any sport environment, we have psychology. Yeah. That is, mm, that is what it is. And then only because you don't have time, it doesn't mean that your brain stops working. It is true that the more time you give people, the more they engage in self-talk, but also mind-wandering and other cogn- higher cognitive processes. Whereas if they have very little time, they need to react. They usually engage less. Yeah. And if I had a, a basketball player who's using goal-directed self-talk in the middle of a defensive action, the interventions I would use with him would probably aim at reducing self-talk because he might just overthink things. That is true. But there is plenty of moments where people can talk to themselves. From the pre-game routines to warm-up to, you know, uh, different free throws uh, in football there. Well, football is very static. If you really look at it in a 90-minute game, they maybe play 50 minutes or or 60 minutes. It gives you half an hour for self-talk. Right. There are, there are people that if I have half an hour conversation with them, they can talk me into the ground. Now imagine what yourself can do with you in 30 minutes. And then there is another thing about self-talk is we don't have to imagine those or think about those conversations as conversations we would have with other people. Like now I'm talking with you in the audience and everything that's in my mind, I'm trying to say it clearly. I'm trying to finish sentences. If you weren't there, half the time I wouldn't have to finish the sentences because once I've said the first part, I already know how it finishes. I know how it ends. So why would I have to say it? So we do have in self-talk, that's a discussion, where does self-talk start and what is thinking? So even though we say it's a verbal process, it might be enough if there's some verbal stimulation in the brain without the creation of all the words. We call that an abbreviation process. So a long sentence that would take me a minute to, talk, to, to say out loud in self-talk could happen in 10 seconds. Mm, interesting. So time is very relative there. If you really want to know how time is relative, there's one thing I always show my students. When we talk about decision-making. Not exactly the same thing, but I show them um, speed chess. Really, go online and watch a video of the world's best players playing speed chess. And then try, I mean, they have millions of options and try and convince yourself that they are not making any decisions. So the same thing, the human brain can work very, very quickly. And definitely, I would say in every sport you have self-taught. Sometimes before, sometimes during, sometimes after. Yeah, I mean, that just decision-making spoke to Dr. Mike Ashford about, I mean, not from the world of chess, but from... Uh, the world of rugby and uh, he talked about three speeds of decision making fast decision making slow decision making and then intuitive perception action which i think is a a fascinating area not quite 100 percent what we're talking about here but i I think fascinating and 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 another question i've got for you is is on acceptance because you've used that word acceptance a lot today and and i do sometimes wonder if the notion of goal-directed self-talk could be synonymous with wrestling with yourself. And maybe it, maybe it is. Um, and 
uh, we we very much as sports psychologists, uh, what seem to have emerged over the last few years, especially, is the ACT framework, uh, acceptance commitment therapy. How does your work on self-talk and how does self-talk in general function alongside something like ACT, acceptance commitment therapy, where it feels a bit more like, I'm going to accept that everything in, that's intuitive and then just commit to executing in my values. That's a very basic way of defining acceptance commitment granted. But how does does, does, you, does, does the self-talk sort of fight against ACT or can it work uh, hand in hand? Oh, you just said it. You just said ACT. If I'm in, in an acceptance state, I say, I'm going to accept what is happening and just use that and so on. So if you tell that to yourself, that's goal-directed self-talk. <laughs> that's a very short answer. Yes, of course, you can talk yourself into accepting your problems. I mean, I can I can expand a little bit more. Let's see if that makes sense. From my perspective, self-regulation has three steps. Yep. First is self-awareness. Then there is the selection of coping strategies. And then there is the implementation of psychological control. First, I get aware that I'm angry. Then I choose a strategy. For example, I want to accept my anger. And now I have to exert some sort of psychological control so that this acceptance becomes reality. So I talk myself into not being nervous about my anxiety or not thinking that my anxiety is bad. So there's three levels. Now, goal-directed self-talk can help, of course, um, implement that psychological control. For example, if you want to turn and anger into into confidence, I tell myself, be confident. Forget about the past and be confident. Now I'm exerting psychological control through goal-directed self-talk. But I could also use goal-directed self-talk to change my coping strategy. Couldn't it be? I could tell myself, no, don't 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 fight anger. Just accept it. And then I have now the acceptance strategy. Now I have to implement that acceptance. And then I tell myself, let go. Smile. Use your anger. What I said at the beginning, tactically, use it. But goal-directed self-talk can also work over self-awareness. So I can talk myself into how do I understand a problem. I can tell myself, no, anger isn't even a problem. It's not that I have to use a different regulation strategy altogether. This is normal. Or I could tell myself, anger is just a symptom. What you really what really a problem is, is your perfectionism. So I can use goal-directed self-talk in many different ways, and it doesn't go against any other theoretical framework. Uh, it doesn't make sense because goal-directed self-talk was created in the human brain without knowing about other uh, theoretical frameworks. So you can talk yourselves into self-acceptance just like you can talk yourself into compensatory strategies and just tell yourself, later you're going to have a bottle of whiskey. You can use goal-directed self-talk for any uh, self-regulation strategy. Avoidance, compensation, social help, object support, acceptance, appraisal, and problem-oriented coping. Okay, so my final question. Um, you've got many coaches listening in competitors as well keen interested listeners from various disciplines and, and worlds um what would be your other than purchasing your book naturally but what would be i suppose the main sort of one two even three primary bits of advice around self-talk that you think would be pertinent for those listening in it's a very broad question i do apologize but what would be what would be the most important thing that you could say to people about self-talk? I'd say my opening statement many times when I meet coaches and athletes and I want to work on self-talk is we all got a little psychologist sitting inside our brain trying to help us through all types of psychologically challenging situations. Now, when you're in the real world, if you choose a psychologist, you would see at their CV where they studied, the experience, the master's courses, and so on. Your inner psychologist 
most of the time, has never gone to university, has never read a book, has zero idea how to help, and still never shuts up. So, educate your inner psychologist. That is how I open up uh, the self-talk interventions I do, the more intensive self-talk interventions, where I change people's goal-directed self-talk. So we have interventions where we use cue words, of course, but then we have interventions where we actually try and train and educate people's inner psychologists. Now, of course, this is a very cartoon-like uh, imagination, having an inner psychologist, but it does the trick for most people. I love it. Yeah, We could also call it the inner coach. So if you have coaches listening, all your athletes have an inner coach. And that inner coach is competing with you, so... You need to educate their inner coach, just like an inner psychologist, the inner nutritionist. Uh, so that's the inner voice. That voice inside people's mind needs to be educated. It needs to know when to talk, when not to talk, how to give instructions, and maybe not most importantly, but also importantly, what to say. I love that. I love that idea of educate your inner psychologist. I think that's fantastic. I think that's fantastic. Alexander, um, I could talk to you for for hours, and I know there's other things that we do want to speak about. Uh, will, will you come on again at some time in the future? I hope so. There's there's another topic I'm studying, and I would really like to share that. Um, not today, but whenever I'm invited again, this was a real pleasure. Yeah, let's definitely do that. Um, how can people get in touch if if you'd like them to get in touch how they how can they follow your work i'm on twitter i'm on linkedin i don't like social media but i'm there depending on my on the moment i'm more in one and the other but more or less uh, you, i have a profile page at the university of suffolk the good thing with my surname is that it exists three times in the world my mum, my dad and myself so if you find Latinyak Alexander, that's probably me. Then we do have a project page for a new project at psychmapping.com. There's also all the contact details there. I'm on ResearchGate. I have an email address. It's quite it's easy to find. Go on the internet, type in my surname, University of Suffolk. You find my email address. And you just write. I usually write back. And the book? Self-Talk in Sports, yes, by Routledge. That's uh, published by Routledge and is available wherever you purchase your books? Yes, I think so. I was lucky enough never have <laughs> to have to buy it, but yeah. You just you just have to Google. You Google it and, and you can get it. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. I can't recommend it enough. It's uh, one of one of my Bibles I keep returning to it and, and there's some, some fantastic chapters in there. And um, you mentioned uh, psych, psych mapping, yes. which um, would definitely be... Uh, the topic of our conversation next time um, because I'm fascinated to learn more about that uh, and I do recommend heading on to your googling that or heading on to your page to, to discover more about site mapping um, Alexander thank you so much for your time it was a pleasure well everybody I really enjoyed that podcast and I'd love to hear what you the listener think so please do get in touch via Twitter or Facebook or through my website danabrahams.com to tell me what you think of the sports Psych show I'd be delighted to hear any suggestions that you have. I'm already looking forward to next week's episode. Bye for now.